This rig rundown is presented by the Yamaha DXR series. Hey everybody, this is Jason Shadrick with PremierGuitar.com and today we have a very special rig rundown with you. We are here with Pete Malandrone, who is Brian May's guitar tech and they're on tour this summer in the States. So we had to take the chance to meet up with you to see all the guitars and effect, effect, effect. And, <laughs> and, uh, and amps that Brian's using on, his, on their summer tour. So thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. No problem. Excellent. So let's start. Now we're going to talk to Brian a little bit about about, this the, old, about old Red yeah, Special that, over that, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to skip over that for the moment, okay. but let's let's keep going down the line okay. and see what else he brought out. This is um, this is a copy of the Red Special uh, made about 15 years ago by an Australian guy called Greg Fryer, um, and it's a very very good spare. It's very very close to the original. A couple of little, just a couple of little differences with the way the pots are configured and stuff, but it, it's basically the, the same guitar. But obviously, he never wants to play that. He only plays that if he breaks a string. Okay, so this will be a backup for the this main is one. A backup for the main one, um, and that's all. That's all it is. It's so if he doesn't break a string, that doesn't get played. So if you never see that guitar, everything's okay. Everything's fine. I, yeah, the string breakages are. You know, we've had a couple, but we haven't touched wood. We haven't had any for about six or seven gigs. And so, what, um, what kind of strings is he using on the guitars now? Optima Gold. Optima Gold, uh, Optima Gold strings, yeah. Used to be Maxima. but. Mm -hmm. And what gauge? Uh, nine. nine. Nine, so quite light. Used to be a bit lighter than that, but um, he used to play on eights. But he was breaking a lot of strings, mm -hmm. especially playing with a coin, Yeah. as you can imagine. Yeah. I mean, he, he's, he, he holds the coin very, very, very lightly, and he drops them all the time. He probably drops like 10 a night, but because he, he holds them so so delicately. Uh -huh. um, I mean, if I played if I played this guitar with a coin, I would be breaking, breaking strings, strings all the time. You know what it's like when you when you first pick up a guitar when you haven't got a pick, you tend to play with a coin and you just you just shred the guitar to pieces. But um, so yeah. he's definitely developed that touch of how to balance the yeah, attack and absolutely. And these these are actually serrated on the edge as well. Um, I don't know if you can see that. So so he can he can use them sideways as well. Mm -hmm. But it's that's like a grater, and there's actually lots of if you look at this, I've cleaned it up a bit, but there's an awful lot of metal filings mm. which collect under there. I um, hope you can see that. So yeah, I have to have to keep brushing those out. So do you have to like before every tour go down to the bank and? Well, I, strangely, they're not that expensive. They're 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 cheaper than guitar picks. Oh. They're only like that. They are well, they're face value now. They're six pence each. And they used to be five pence each, but they've gone up. They might be seven pence each, but I buy them in bags of a hundred. It's not. It's not difficult to get hold of them. Okay. Yeah. And so, for our, our American friends, a pence. Can you describe like the a, American a value? It's probably a cent. Okay. So it's like a one cent. Well, uh, no, it's a six cent. Well, it's about eight cents, I suppose. I don't know. Okay. It's, so essentially it, like a penny kind of is, thing. But the thing is that the, these were used pre-decimal when it wasn't a hundred pence in a pound. So it's very difficult to say how much they were actually worth. Right. Look how the internet was for. <laughs> All right, so we have red special, we have the backup, yep. and then what else is down the line and here? And then we have a drop D tuning, uh, another copy by a English luthier called Andrew Guyton. Um, this is drop D, this is just for fat bottom girls because he plays it in the drop D tuning. Um, so that's that. Um, exactly the same setup on the straps. We have a treble booster first out of the guitar. Uh, that's probably a better one to look at there. So we have a treble booster first, and that goes into the radio pack and then comes back here. Uh, so that's the Green Guyton. That's known as the Green Guyton. I would imagine you've experimented wearing the signal chain to put the treble booster. The treble booster has to go first. It has we, to go we first. discovered that a long, long time ago. If you put it after the radio, if you put it at this end, it just doesn't. It just doesn't do it. It's but it's hitting the pack very hard. The packs are that they're they're flat out. They're peaking the whole time. But he, he he likes that sound. It's not it's not exactly the same as a lead sound. Right. Fairly obviously, um, but the freedom it gives him. Is just yeah. where well, you imagine you imagine trying to get them on a lead on this stage. It's just it would just be impossible. And so tell us a little bit about the treble booster. Are they were they, were they his own design? Did he work with somebody well, on they, them? They originally, back in the probably the early 70s, it was a range master, a, a yeah. Dallas range master treble booster. And over the years, that it's sort of it's just been copied and copied and copied by 
uh, people, like, uh, people like Pete Cornish, who's a very famous um, rig designer in England. So he made a load. And but the trouble is with those and and the ones, the later ones, one of which I've got here. Um, this is this is like a, tr a, a treble booster that you can buy. Yep. Uh, but these they're quite heavy. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, all that circuitry. We've got a guy called Nigel Knight who who makes them now, and it's it's as Knight Audio Technologies is his company. Mm -hmm. um, so we're selling these. Um, in England, but they're very light. Mm -hmm. So obviously, for a two, you know, over a two-hour show, yeah. it's you, you need it. You need it. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So it's pretty much the same exact circuit, just rehoused. Yeah, in there? more or less. Okay. A couple of little tweaks and okay. and stuff. Like Secret that, tweaks or anything you want? Um, but I don't understand electronics, oh. so I don't know. <laughs> You'll have to ask him. <laughs> and this this one is another. This one is basically a cop, a, a, another copy of the Red Special. The, the pickups in this one are a little bit hotter, uh -huh. uh, and it does squeal a bit. This one, um, but this is, this is just a spare for the drop D. Okay. Um, so cause, because I'm half blind, I have to have fluorescent stickers on them, so I know which ones they are. Are there still Burns pickups in these, or what yeah, kind yeah, of? Yeah, still still Trisonic pickups. These are these are hand wired ones mm -hmm. uh, by a guy called called Adrian Turner, um, who has the patent for the uh, Phaeton wheel. Uh, which is what he uses to wind them. So he's he's very fastidious about getting the correct, exact correct yes. pickups. And the three on the old on the red special um, are actually they're quite they're different values. So um, are those the original pickups? Yeah, the original okay. pickups, but they're not all they're not all the same. I so I have a set of spare pickups, and it's bridge, middle, and and um, neck. Yep. Um, so they are specific. They are specific to those positions. Mm -hmm. And this one is a little beauty. This is one of the only guitars in Brian's collection that I really, really, really want. Yeah. Um, this is a, this, this, this F hole, on the original plans for the Red Special, it had an F hole, mm -hmm. um, but they never, they never cut it out. But this is the, this is the original F hole design. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a beautiful arch yeah. top semi-acoustic guitar with a molded scratch plate which I've never seen before well I've certainly never seen one as good as that and apparently the guy who made it Andrew Guyton again said it was the biggest bitch he's ever had to deal with trying to get this to contoured um, so he uses this guitar on crazy little thing called love it's, it's quite a nice little trick because he, he starts off playing acoustic yep. and then he doesn't do anything and I change it to electric so he can do the so he can do the first part of the solo on this guitar. Mm -hmm. So it switches over if I get it right. Yeah. If I haven't got a hangover, <laughs> then uh, if I get it right, then um, yeah. So it's quite a sort of neat little trick. And he's got a badger on there because he likes saving badgers. I think. Um, so he's got a little badger on there. Yeah. So this is the badger guitar, and nice. it's an absolute and beauty. If I remember right, he used the Telecaster on the on the That's original. Right. So does the one? the brass. Uh, well, this is a fixed tail bridge. piece I mean, and stuff. It's a fixed yeah. bridge, so yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's it's not trying to sound adds like a, a little, telecaster. Adds a little twang to it. Though. A little bit, yeah. yeah, quite a lot, and because it's so it's so lively, mm -hmm. it's a but it's a it's an absolutely beautiful guitar, and, same and I love it. Controls as yeah, exactly the same three pickup controls in or out of phase, and that just that just happens to be the configuration that he plays on that song, so that won't change from that position. That's um, that's neck and bridge out of phase on that. So there you are go. These and the, the phase ones and these are the these are the on-offs and okay. these are the phases. Okay. So and, and, and that's tone never touches that, okay. and that's that's volume. Okay. Is that usually? Does he play with that throughout the night? Or does oh he, god, yeah, yeah. That's how he controls everything. Without without pedals, that's how he makes it clean, or he makes it really distort. That's mm -hmm. that's basically how he does it. So there you go. That's yeah, the guitar. It's a beautiful so guitar. Just, it is a beautiful guitar. Don't touch it. No treble booster on this one? Uh, yeah, the treble booster oh. for that one, because this is wired. The treble for the booster for that one is in here. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so, yeah, we, uh, that's, uh, that's on that long wire there, which he can almost get across the other side of the stage <laughs> with that. If he could tune it quickly enough to do right. fat bottom girls on it, he would. He, he only wants to play that. He, yeah. he doesn't. He wants that back. If he breaks the string, he just wants that back as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So when this one comes out, it just comes out long enough for you to change Absolutely. the string and then it goes right Absolutely. back then out. It goes, then it goes back. As soon as I can get it back to him, it goes back. All right. So it'll go from the guitar to the treble booster to the wireless pack. And then where does it come over here? Uh, it comes uh, into one of these two receivers here. So this is the main receiver and this is the spare receiver. So if he breaks a string, I do that. And that switches from that pack, sorry, that, that receiver to that receiver. Um, so that's how I do that. If he wants to go on to the... Uh, the, 
this semi-acoustic for mm -hmm. a crazy little thing called Love, I put them on the lead, which is that one. Mm -hmm. And it's, it really is <laughs> that simple. So from, out, from there, it then goes through this crybaby wah-wah, which is the pedal out there. It's just a controller, so mm -hmm. the, it's a voltage controller. So that switches it on and off from out there. And it looks like you have it set pretty flat as far as the yep, frequencies. Absolutely, absolutely flat. There's no EQ in there. It just said, yep, that's it. So it's all marked just where he likes it. And from here, it comes into this box. Uh, and this is, my, this is my effect that I can, if I turn it on, I can mute the amps from here. Um, not that I ever need to do, oh, I do need to do it a couple of times during the show, actually. Um, but it, it's they're so noisy these amps when they're talking on stage or in rehearsals and stuff I just sit here and, and I just mute them because it just saves everybody's ears yeah. so this comes in in here and then there's a send there's one send which goes to this first TC electronics G major 2 box and if that blows up I do that mm -hmm. and it switches to the second TC electronics box they're all controlled by this box up here Nigel Knight built this for me and it's basically a MIDI switcher, just with 16 MIDI yeah. channels on it. And whichever effect that I press, both of the boxes change down here. So that's it. So I'm switching stuff all through the night. It's, there's not a lot, though. It's not 99% of the show, or 98% is on this setting here. Uh -huh. the, the delay guitar solo that he plays in the middle, yeah. I would be on there. This is two, there's two slight little changes in Show Must Go On, which is pitch shifting. There's a guitar solo in Days of Our Lives, which has got a delay, same with Stone, Stone Cold Crazy. There's one note in Seven Seas of Raya, <laughs> which I hit. There's also one note in I Want It All, uh -huh. uh, which I hit. And this is just the, the crazy noises in the middle of um, Another One Bites the Dust. So there's no tap tempo, it's all already pre-programmed. Is there pre a click that the band is playing no. to? No, no okay. click. No kick. In fact, yeah, there's a sample on Days of Our Lives, mm -hmm. um, which is which is playing, which is. But there's no there's no click track. No, it's all it's all wild, um, which is how you want it to be. That's right. We don't like tape. No. It's proper band, proper old rock band, <laughs> doing it the proper way. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the only thing we have on tape really is Fred. We have a bit of Fred. Fred turns up on tape. You know. So tell us also about the Avalon DI you have here. Is that for the? Uh the piezo that's, on the that, that's for the piezo yeah the piezo pick up on um on the crazy little thing guitar uh this box is just to stop it buzzing it was buzzing between this and the rack so this is an isolator box um which everybody should have in their toolkit mm -hmm. it's a marvelous device you can buy them from mike hill services in the uk and every <laughs> every guitar tech in the world should have five of those Right. They get you out of all sorts of problems. All right, now that we've finished talking about these other guitars, let's sit down with Brian May and talk to him about the Red Special. And we are backstage with the one, Brian May, and his, uh, his main girl for a long, long time, Red. So we wanted to uh, have you discuss a little bit about uh, your main guitar here. So tell us a little bit about when you first started to build this guitar. Was it something that you wanted to just build a guitar, or were there certain things that the guitars at the time you were playing didn't have that you needed? Uh, the basic thing was I didn't have any money, so mm -hmm. I couldn't buy any of those guitars. So I could look at them in brochures, you know, the Fenders and the Gibsons or whatever, even the Hofners, who were the sort of English um, copies, mm -hmm. uh, emulations of those, and I couldn't afford any of them. So it was like, make a guitar, and that's the only way. Yeah. So that was it. Having taken up the challenge, it was let's make something better than anything that's ever been out there, you know, because both me and my dad had that kind of attitude. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing to the max, you know. Mm -hmm. So it became a challenge to try and take the guitar a step forward. Um, and in some ways, I think we succeeded, partly by luck, partly by good design. But, you know, there's a lot of things about this which became um, standard later on, which were our ideas. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of what we did. Out of bits and pieces, as you know, you know, yeah. it was made out of all sorts of stuff that was just lying around. I'm actually shocked myself that it's still here, <laughs> <laughs> and it's been around the world. I don't know how many times now, you know, but it's, but she still works, and um, you know, with very little maintenance, really, except a bit of refinishing by Greg Fryer a few years ago. Um, but yeah, it's never been refretted. I've never had to take the tremor off to do it. I've never had to replace. Well, we replace rollers when they when they fall off, but um, never had to replace the unit. Um, mm -hmm. So here it is. And after you'd built this, was 
you feel like you kind of obviously got it right the first time. Did you ever aspire to build more guitars? Or once you finally perfected this, you were like, that's it? Yeah, well, I didn't have time. That's the truth after that. But, um, yeah, we designed a couple of others, one of which was um, um, a kind of lozenge-shaped guitar, which actually Andrew Guyton has made for me now. It's mm -hmm. kind of spade-shaped, which is fun. It's sort of the opposite to the um, the thing that Brian Jones used to play, you know, the spades the other way around. Uh, that works pretty well. And uh, actually, originally, I designed this with an F-hole and, um, you know, like a proper semi-acoustic, but I never got around to doing that, and it was too difficult, to be honest. Mm -hmm with the technology I had, because it was all hand tools. Um, but recently, Andrew Guyton made us one of those. Did you see that? Yeah. An arch top, which is beautiful. And it has a pickup in the, in the bridge, so it sounds pretty authentic, acoustic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, this is the only guitar, really, that I made and, and functioned with, and it became a part of me. What uh, looking back now, you have all these years uh, of hindsight. Obviously, what you, the decisions you made designing worked, but were, was there anything that you're like looking back, you know, had I known something now, I maybe would have tweaked this a little bit with maybe a uh, electronics or a bridge setup or something like that? No, there isn't really. It had a few tweaks along the way, but really nothing radical. I mean, for instance, I changed the polarity of these pickups so that these two would humbuck when they were in the position that I usually use, mm -hmm. when they're in series, in phase. And I arranged it so that when these two were out of phase, they humbuck, which is something pretty unusual. But that's because I use them out of phase a lot, like in the Bohemian Rhapsody solo. So these humbuck in that position. Mm -hmm. So that entailed turning, I forget which one, turning one of these upside down and changing the polarity. Um, apart from that, you know, there's been so little ever done to this. You know, the, most of the decisions I would stick by now, the fact that we've got pretty much zero friction here because of the rollers, mm -hmm. we've got pretty much zero friction here because the strings go almost straight through, which is very unusual, laterally and vertically, and they're located vertically by the, the zero fret. And this nut has no bottom to it, so they're lo they're, they float in the vertical space mm -hmm. on the nut. And that works really well too. Um, oh yeah, the only other thing we changed would be the machine heads because they wore out. Yeah. But actually these are much better than the machine heads I originally put on. Uh, are those locking tuners? They lock, yeah. yeah, which does make a big difference, I have to say. They're nice. I think they're shallows. You know, but most of this is homemade uh, with bits and pieces. Yeah, I don't, you know, the neck is a, Pete probably told you, is, is a piece of an old fireplace, which was 100, year, 100 years old at the time, and you can just about see the wormholes that I filled up with matchsticks here. This is all done with hand tools. There's a very solid piece of oak, which is the main strain bearer of the guitar in here but it's enveloped in uh, veneer and the main part of the body is hollow and that's made out of block board covered with veneer, veneer. can't speak can't speak <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking a little bit earlier and we kind of sussed out that it was about 63 64 when you were building this you're about 17 mm -hmm. took you about two years yeah so what was that first gig like when you finished it you and your dad you had this it, it worked and you get up on stage and you and you hit it. Did it, did, uh, did the lights and whistles and bells chime off, or were you like, oh, there's, we're not done yet? You know, it was pretty amazing. You know, it was a dream come true. I had been kind of playing it all along at home, you know, as it progressed. But I think the first time it was ever used was at Molsey Boat Club, uh, which is on the banks of the Thames in somewhere near Putney, um, in England. Mm -hmm. And my group was 1984, and I got up and played it, and it was amazing. It was quite stupendous, and that became my instrument from that, that day forward. Um, it worked. We were, you know, a lot of our dreams came true, and um, still does. Mm -hmm. And so we have, uh, obviously, the, the, pick, the selectors down here for on and off and out of phase. What are some mm. of your favorite settings for this, or, or some favorite solos when, you, mm. when you're playing live? Well, uh, these are the on-off switches here, off, on, for this pickup, that pickup, and that pickup, and these are the phase switches, as you say. Um, that was an innovation. Nobody had done that at the time, and very few people have now, actually, in fact. Uh, a few people took up the design. Basically, my favorite home base is these two in phase. So it's that, those two are down, and those two are down. This is off. Um, that gives me my basic sort of... Um, uh, a great chord sound with the AC30s and also quite a bit of fatness. Um, great for so long. It's great for almost everything, depending on where the volume control is. And of course, the AC30s with the treble boosters, I use them 
are kind of infinitely variable as regards saturation. They distort incredibly beautifully, smoothly. So I can find little positions on here where the where the chords are still clean, but it will sustain. So this is a, a nice configuration. Um, these two together is fat, very fat, very kind of plummy. And I use that just uh, for the very beginning of Bohemian Rhapsody when it's live here. Um, but I very quickly s flick them out of phase for the solo. And that gives this real screech because that's this position. These two down, so these two pickups are on. One's down and one's up. There's a redundancy. I mean, they can be like this or they can be like that, um, which may make a difference in, in, in some places. Um, yeah, but they're out of phase and they're humbucking, so there's not too much extraneous noise, <laughs> which can be a real problem, as you probably know. Um, and they scream. I mean, you just hit them. It, it, it obviously helps if you hit somewhere down here, but basically you get such a high cancellation of the fundamental and such an enhancement of those high harmonics that it screeches it just screams so all these harmonics will just zoom out without much encouragement you can encourage them as well but it gives me that lovely kind of um i, I don't know if i can even describe the sound but it, it, it gives it that uh, uh that bohemian rhapsody solo sound yeah. <laughs> i guess <laughs> these two out of phase give a real kind of crunch now, logically they should give you the most harmonic content in a way because they're furthest away and they're, therefore their harmonic content will be the most different and I use that for Stone Cold Crazy because it's just harsh and it gives strangely enough it does have a, a low end too it has a, a kind of brown warmth to it as well which is really good so if I'm I normally play with a heel of my hand on here so if I damp it a little bit that warmth will come out and it's it's surprisingly good for soloing mm -hmm. so I use all these combinations I use this one on its own for th for just a clang you know this gives you a lovely rich kind of uncolored sound so for, if I want chords to clang out like in now I'm here this is what I'll use and then I can switch this one in if it once I'm doing the main riff these two in phase I don't use very much it gives you a kind of um, a sound a bit like a a Gibson 335, you know, that sweetness, which some of the blues players have liked. And uh, I occasionally like it, but it's not me. It's too sweet for me. Um, just has a, a strange feeling to it. Um, and these two out of phase, yeah, not very often. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really occur to me to use that. But one day you'll find the... The, the yeah. right situation. <laughs> I, mean, I, I deliberately used every single combination when we were recording Bohemian Rhapsody just for fun. Yeah. You know, so every time you hear did it, did it, did it, a little bit, there's octaves and stuff, and I used every single combination for those just mm -hmm. to get the maximum amount of variation of, of color. And this is still to this day. Pete was mentioning that, you know, ninety eight percent of the show is on this guitar. Unless you break yeah. a string, or yeah. you need something for like a drop D tuning for a song. Drop D is one thing, and acoustic is another thing. But mm -hmm. apart from that, yeah, it's this guitar. Yeah. Also, a unique part of your style is instead of a traditional guitar pick, you use a sixpence coin. So tell us a little bit about how you kind of stumbled upon this, and and what you dig about it over a traditional guitar pick. Well, I went through a whole journey. Really, I used to make very flexible picks because I thought that was the way to sort of become kind of fluid and fast or whatever, because it wouldn't affect the way you, you, you move your fingers backwards and forwards. And I found I didn't like it. I found I liked it the harder picks because I could feel more of the action in my fingers. And so one day, I suppose, I just tried this because I, I thought, well, this will give me absolutely everything that happens at the string I will feel in the fingers. So this is giving me zero um, flexibility. But in fact, I, need, I get all the flexibility I, I need from here. So I love this. It, you know, it, to me, I feel everything. I'm in total contact with the strings. There's nothing that happens. I can even feel the serrations as it goes like this. I can feel it in my fingers. So. And you're not holding it very tightly, right? I hold it loosely so that it can flex, and so you get all, all the flexibility you need. But it gives you variation as well, because if it's very parallel to the strings like this, it's very clean, very nice, you know, and the single note is just... You know, but if you angle it like this to varying degrees, it gives you this kind of splutter, which in combination with the heel of the hand, 
gives you almost the same kind of articulation as a human voice. Mm -hmm. I love that ability to make it kind of splutter. It's a kind of consonant sound, you know. They don't wear out. They don't hurt the strings because this is softer metal than steel. This is like nickel silver. And um, they last forever. And I have a thousand of them. <laughs> and they're very cheap. So this to me is the ultimate, you know. Also, they don't get stuck in the string. You know, a lot of plexums that have a lot of point to them, you're sort of getting stuck under the string. This will never do that because it's round. So you can keep... So my finger is always... My hands are always doing this. You know, I think the secret of playing rhythmically is keeping this going. You know, you're not supposed to be doing this kind of thing, you know, except in rare occasions for certain effects. Most of the fluidity comes from, from doing this, and this is ideal. And how long have you, since you converted and found this and have only used six pences? Oh, years, years, yeah, no. 40 years, I suppose, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're easy to come by. You know, I mean, a, a dime will work as well, pretty right. much. <laughs> Qu <laughs> quarter will kind of work, and, but a dime is probably good. But, but, the, but the tone is the best with the six pence. I think six pence <laughs> is good. Like, pre... Pre-1950, six pence is pretty okay, good because yeah. they have a different uh, composition. They went downhill after that. Yeah, well, they began, the composition was changed after that. They cheapened the composition after that. But 1947 is a particularly good year, obviously. Because <laughs> that's my year, man. Yeah, having talked about the pick, of course, I use a lot with the fingers. So the pick is good, but, you know, the fingers are still pretty damn good. You can hear the serrations on there. Have you ever experiment in a studio with other guitars, or is this your main? Occasionally, yeah. Yeah, but this will do all that, really. You know, I can get all that on here, really. I did use a a kind of Stratocaster, no, a, a Telecaster on Crazy Little Thing. You know, I was persuaded to do that, but actually, this does it fine. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. Let's shift gears and catch up with Pete to find out about Brian's amps. Here we are with the uh, the wall of Vox. Uh -huh. So tell us a little bit about how Brian is, is setting this up and why the amps are turned the way they are. And they're how they're turned the way. It's, it's not a very deep stage because all this all this um, scenery and stuff. That uh, when they were when they were more face on, they were straight in his back, and he just didn't like it. Uh, this this carpet, it, even it, you know, it's 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 not aesthetic. It actually stops the rebound as well mm -hmm. off a stage like this, and it's a it's a hollow stage, yeah. so it, we have to stop the nasty reflections. Um, also, a job I haven't done today is when Brian's playing up there. I have to put a blanket over this because it hits that and goes up there and oh. sounds horrible. Um, so a lot there's a lot of reflections that I'm trying to stop. Obviously, I'm trying to trying to protect Roger here as well from the back of the amp, mm -hmm. which is why we we have a perspex screen on here. Um, so basically the top three are, as most people know, are they're dummy, uh, they're, well they're not dummy cabinets, they, they carry all my spare speakers. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's always looked like this, so, so it yeah, has to look like this. These are sp three spare amplifiers in case any one of these three blow up. And I can just throw those out the way, lift that one down. I have two more spares here. Mm -hmm. um, and these three amps are all the same. These are like sort of late were well, early 70s but they've all been slightly modified all of these amps are slightly modified these ones heavily modified yeah. a few a good few years ago um i just wanted all the all the circuitry that wasn't needed take taken it. out mm -hmm. um because it just improves reliability uh one thing we didn't look at there was the power supply i have a power supply okay um in the bottom of that rack which gives me 234 volts mm -hmm. at 50 hertz which is exactly what these want to see anywhere in the world so if you give me your silly american girly power <laughs> then i can make it <laughs> i can make it right i can make it man's yes. power yes yeah, stuff that will kill you if you touch it <laughs> and this 110 rubbish um so yeah i can i can get i can get these i can i can give these exactly what they want and it does it does bring the reliability up yeah. a lot um these are actually built for the we will rock you theatre show by again Greg Fryer he also does amp stuff and they've just proved they're, in, they're, in, they're very reliable but they're also they sound very very nice they sound very very warm um, but with w they're just very pleasant sounding amps so I, I have three of these at the moment I could do with another three really 
but maybe one day I'll get around to those. Mm. But they, these are close enough. You wouldn't with it with the volume he's playing at. You can't tell the difference between that amp and that amp. I can yeah. tell you now. Yeah, you yeah. Uh, you cannot tell the difference. So so all three amps are, get, are getting the same signal. No, the the, cen oh. the center amp is straight through the rack. So there's no effects on the okay. center amp so at all. The wet stuff on the wet stuff is is nice. all wet on the left and right. So when he's playing the the Brighton Rock solo, yeah. which has got an 800 800 millisecond delay and a 1600 millisecond delay. He gets the original single out, signal out of there, then he gets that one 800 milliseconds later, then he gets that one 1600 milliseconds later, so it goes dunk, dunk, dunk. Yeah. And it's the same out of that he, he's got the, all these side fills of the guitar. So we have one here, yep. right here behind us. We have two under there and we have the two on the side here. So when you stand in the middle, it's an amazing sound because you hear it behind you, then to the left, and, then to, and it's just an amazing, so the side fills are mimicking the amp setup. Yeah, yep. yeah, that's it. And he just he has a bit of bass guitar in there and a little bit of snare and kick in the front, and that's it. Now on the on the amps themselves, is he setting them up differently between the three? Are they all they're as all the far? Same. As the they're all the same. They're all flat out. Yep. So they're flat out. All the tone controls are off. The cut's fully up, and the master volume is fully up. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to set. And you just you just do that with every single control. You set the volume, which you turn flat out, and it goes in the normal input. And you mentioned these up here are housing your extra speakers. Is yeah. it common for him to go through speakers? Or? Speakers, yeah. We blow, he blows quite a few speakers. Again, touch wood. We haven't had amp failure or a, a speak failure or anything so far. Uh -huh. I think it's, it's, it's down to, a lot of it's down to the, to that power supply, keeping yes. it all so smooth. I mean, these, are, these poor little things are hanging on for dear life, you know. <laughs> They're like that by their fingernails, waiting, uh -huh. to, waiting to go bang. But, um, they're, but they're slim and trim. They got the uh, excess stuff out of there, and yeah, they're absolutely yeah, and and a high quality valves as well. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the or that, tubes. Uh, yeah, sorry, tubes. <laughs> yeah, whatever you call them. A tube's something we ride in London. You see, that's yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, the valves are tubes. Sorry, um, they're, they're very high quality. They're they're blast tested for a long time. A lot, a lot more than a lot higher. Um, input input than than they would get in this, but they're blast tested at that for like. A day if they survive that I get them okay um, so yeah and I've got a, I've got a big box full of tubes mm -hmm. um, yeah <laughs> all right so we've covered everything from the sixpence to the guitars the effects the amp setup here are there any other secrets that we need to share for Brian May's tone no there is a, there is no secret everybody asks me that is it what's the secret Paul Crook from who's plays in meatloaf band who's a very good friend of Brian's came down the other day he, and he is an absolutely brilliant guitar player mm -hmm. he picked up Brian's guitar Brian said play this and he's a, an amazing guitar player he didn't sound anything like Brian mm -hmm. not like, and nothing like Brian yeah, yeah. through his rig his guitar and he sounds nothing like him it doesn't nobody does no nobody can sound like Brian but Brian I've said it before and I'll say it again if Brian picks up a shitty $50 acoustic guitar he sounds like Brian May right. And that's what all great guitar players are like. That's you know, right, it's, that's, right. that's what it is. There is no secret. Yeah. It's it's a guitar and a treble booster and AC30 is effectively what it is. Mm -hmm. And he can, he just sounds like him. Yeah. And that's that's all there is to it. Absolutely. You missed the you missed the oh, pedal. Let's you missed the only thing right. Brian has to do for himself. Come on, <laughs> give him some credit. All right. So Brian has one important job here. Yeah. And that's just rocking this pedal yeah, back rocking and forth. That, rocking that pedal. All right, Pete. Thank you so much for taking us on pleasure. a tour of uh, Brian's rig. Absolute pleasure. Next time you come, bring me a T-shirt, will you? Will do. Will okay. do. This is Jason Shadrick and Pete Malindrone with PremierGuitar.com. Don't forget to sign up for PG Perks, your all-access pass to exclusive gear giveaways and discounts on PremierGuitar.com.